Good afternoon. Hello. Hello, hello. So I think we'll let uh, people continue to wander in. I know the food truck lines are long and wet and uh, not a lot of fun this afternoon. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started nonetheless now and then just let people wander in as they wander in, I think. Uh, my name's Tom Darby, and I have been attending Radiant with my wife, Karen, for 22 years now. Karen's right over there, yeah. We definitely, definitely feel blessed to have been here for that long. I've been an elder here now for a little over 10 years. And Karen and I own four businesses uh, with our children in the Plainwall, Michigan area. So we have uh, four children, a uh, son-in-law, my daughter just got married a month or so ago, and then a daughter-in-law. Um, the four kids work with us in the businesses. So a lot of people wonder, I wonder if they still like each other, do they still get along? And they do, and we do. Uh, they, we still have Sunday lunches every Sunday at 1 o'clock. They all come. We spend time together. Uh, we vacation together still. So everybody still gets along, and that is a miracle, and it's a God thing. So we're just thankful for that. We never expected that um, all of them would work in the businesses. We just prayed that God would send them wherever he wanted them, and we tried to train them up and pray over them and talk to them about we wanted them to do what God wanted them to do and we were blessed just in an amazing way that he placed on all of their hearts to come and work with us so we're thankful for that. So we started our first business um, in 1995. Um, I grew up around here so I went to Gull Lake uh, High School then I left got a mechanical engineering degree down in Indiana and then had three job opportunities and came back up here to work for an aerospace company for 10 years before um, I uh, started our first business and felt called to start our first business. So the marketplace as a mission field um, to me was something that um, I really didn't think about when I was young. Um, I grew up in a home, I went to church uh, at a Catholic church not far from here Grew up in a home where my father was the son of a Irish father and an Italian mother, so a pretty wild situation. And um, so he grew up going to the Catholic uh, school in the Catholic church. And then my mom was just an on fire, Holy Spirit filled woman. So, um, but I grew up always knowing uh, and believing that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that um, God was God. But I chose at a young age when I was in high school uh, to believe that the world, what the world had to offer was better than what God did. So I chased that through high school, chased that through college, and then my first experience with a marketplace mission, missionary or mission field was my senior year in college. My friend graduated before I did, and he went to work for this company. And I received a letter in the mail. Back then we got mail, it wasn't on phones. And um, that letter said, hey, I met this guy in the workplace and he led me to Jesus in a relationship with him. And he said, you need this. And I can remember thinking to myself as that was going on, I hate to say this, but I'm thinking, oh no, I lost my best friend because I wasn't ready yet. I always knew that I would make a decision for Jesus. I just thought I would do it when I was old. I, I was believing what the world was telling me, and I thought, when I'm old and stop having fun, then I'll make that decision. But he was after me, so he sent me letters. I got time for me to graduate, and I had three job offers, and one of them was at where he worked. And at that point, um, I was, you know, been poor, been in college for four years, so my sole decision was based on who was offering the most money, and that company offered the most money. God knew right where he wanted me, and he found a way to get me there. So I got there, and he just stayed after me, and, and then I got a roommate. That roommate was a believer since the time he was born, I think, so he was after me. And then my mom was praying for me, so I was a marked man. So about six months later, they were both after me and saying, hey, there's this Christian concert at Miller Auditorium, and we want you to go with us. I said, no, I don't want to go, but they just kept pestering me, pestering me, and finally I said, you know what, yeah, I'll go. So I went, and I just had a radical experience with God at that, um, at that music festival is what it was. I think it was Steve Camp that was there singing, 
and giving a message, and it was just amazing. So they made an altar call at the end. I stood up, and I felt like I floated down there. And from that time on, I was just on fire. So I got to work that Monday, and my friend came up and said, hey, Mike, who was the guy who had led him to Christ, would like to see you at break time. So I went up there at break, and Mike said, hey, I'd like you to come and be a part of our Bible studies that we're doing here at work. And he said, I'm also going to start a small group in the evenings. And he had four of us um, that were, two of us were brand new believers. One was not a believer. And then uh, another, my roommate who had been a believer since he was really young. And he said, I'd like to disciple you guys and meet in homes, our homes, uh, once a week in the evenings uh, for the next year. Would you be willing to do that? And I didn't know why, but I said, yeah, you bet. I would be willing to do that. So that was my first experience with somebody in the marketplace who looked at it as a mission field. So I had made a decision, and his name was Mike. Mike didn't just say, okay, that's good enough. Tom's saved, and Tom's going to heaven. Mike said, hey, now the real work starts, and how do we go through this discipleship process? So he took the four of us, and it kind of grew. The one, the one individual who came into that group and hadn't accepted Christ yet, accepted him at the first meeting that we were at. So then we were all Christians, and away we went. And he poured into us over the next year. He poured into us um, having us memorize scripture. He poured into us speaking into us, teaching us how to read the Bible, teaching us what the words meant as we were reading. What does it mean to be redeemed? What does it mean to be saved? What is, it, what is grace? What is favor? What are all of those types of things? So that as we read through the Bible, we had a better understanding of what it was. He taught us principles on being a husband, being a father. He taught us principles on the workplace. And then as we got to the end of this time, as we were getting to the end of our year, he started to tell us, you know what? If all you do is take this information and how I've poured into you and how God's poured into you over, the, over this past year and you do nothing with it but keep it to yourself, he said, this has been a waste of time. He said, I'm doing this for you so that you can go out and do this for other people so that they can go out and do this for other people and we can keep this going. So that was my experience with um, the marketplace. And at the end of that time, um, I started to, as he said that, I started to meditate on Ephesians 2.10, which says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he created in advance for us to do. So that, that he created in advance for us to do weighed heavy on my heart at that time. So I started to pray. And what is he taught us how to pray and taught us how to do things. He said, if you really want your prayers to be effective, you have to understand what God's will is. Because that, if you're inside of God's will and you're praying inside of God's will for his life, then he's going to make it happen through his power. So I started to pray that. I said, you know, what is it that you prepared in advance for me to do? And I started to think, oh, you know, our, like at, in my early 20s, I'm thinking, are you going to send me to some foreign country? Or am I going to go into a church and work for a church? Or what am I going to do? And as I prayed through this and sought it out, what I felt him saying to me was, I have you right where I want you. I want you in the marketplace, and I want you going out and pouring into people's lives there. And I think for a lot of us, for many of us, um, that's what our call is. You know, we can't all be called into full-time ministry in the church. A lot of us are called to full-time ministry in life, in the marketplace, pouring into people. So if you look at um, the marketplace as a mission field, so there's a uh, little under 200 countries in the world. The United States is the third largest country, so you've got China, India, and then the United States. But if you look at the marketplace, inside of the United States, there's 150 to 160 million people working in the marketplace. That would make the United States marketplace the ninth largest country in the world. And right now, if you're working in the marketplace, you're seeing a need for Jesus. I'm seeing God move in the marketplace in ways that I haven't in the past 35 years that I've been there. But part of that, I believe, is because if you go back 50 years when I was young, most all my friends 
and their parents went to church. So mo most people were going to church. It's just what you did. Now, I'm not saying everybody was on fire for Jesus and um, they had a relationship with him like they should, but at least they were there and they were hearing and there was an opportunity to share and they were learning things. And uh, you, you look today and you can look at any of the statistics and less and less people are going to church. I don't think God's sitting around saying, hey, let's wait for them to come to us. He told us in the Great Commission that we, we need to go out and go to them. And that's what's going on in the marketplace right now. I've had opportunities to speak at a lot of different places, and I've had opportunities to get to know um, the head of the Wesleyan Church for the United States and Canada and spend time with him. And the Wesleyan Church right now is doing something that they call marketplace multipliers. So it's moving through that church right now where they're training people up inside of their congregations to go out and be missionaries into the mission field. Part of a group that's um, CEA, Christian Employers Alliance, it's doing the same types of things. Um, a group called C12 where there's uh, over 200 different groups of business people who meet once a month and pour into each other's businesses and pray over the their businesses and their communities and what's going on in the lost. But the biggest thing that's going on is I'm seeing more and more people awake to the fact that we're called to go and do this, we're called to share our faith, and we're called to do it in the marketplace, even though society tells us um, that that's something maybe that uh, we're not supposed to do. So the Barna Group in 2018 did a study, and what they based it on was they called people and they interviewed people who attended church at least two times a month and believed that uh, the Bible was God's written word. And they asked them some questions. So this kind of tells you where the mindset has been, and I I'm seeing it change, but uh, where it has been. And that is, the first question they asked them was, should we act ethically in the workplace as Christians? You'd think that would be a no-brainer, but it was 82% of the people said yes. I'm not sure what the 18% were thinking, but... <laughs> Still, 82% said yes. And then they asked them, should we make friends with non-Christians in the workplace? Only 66% said yes. Just making friends with non-Christians in the workplace. And then they asked them, should we share our faith in the workplace? And only 24% said yes. So that's not that 24% were sharing their faith. That's just asking them, if they thought they should share their faith. So we, we, in the Western church, I'm sure not in this room, if you're here and you're at this conference, you know, you're not having this issue. But in the Western church as a whole, what we're seeing more and more um, is people step out of this and start to step in the realization that, hey, we're called to pray at church. We've, we, we, you know, the conference has spoke a whole, the conference has been awesome, by the way, eh? Yeah, so amazing. But speaking about prayer and so much time in prayer, in prayer inside of our churches, but these are all church buildings for the local church. We are the church. So prayer inside of our businesses, prayer outside in the marketplace is no different and no less important than what it is inside of these four walls. We need to take it out into those places if we want to see our workplaces change and if we want to see our communities change. So what are some of the reasons that people gave for not sharing in the workplace? Uh, they said, not an appropriate location. I'm being paid to work, not share. Now, there is some truth to that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, that we're paid to work and we need to be a good example and we need to do that. But I don't see in any of the verses in the Bible where God talks about us going out and sharing our faith where he says, hey, do it everywhere but the workplace. You know, don't do it there. I mean, if you just look at Jesus, his example, and when he went down to the Lake of Galilee um, with Peter and James and got on their boat after they had been fishing all night long, hadn't caught anything. Now, that's their workplace. That's where they're working. That's their job. If we're not supposed to go in the workplace, what was he doing going there? So he goes down there. They're getting done with their shift. He borrows their equipment. He stands on it, and he goes ahead and he gives a message. And then when he's done, he does a miracle there. Should, should we see miracles in the workplace? 
we have seen miracles in our workplace. We should expect miracles in our workplace. And Jesus did, work, did miracles in the workplace. You can even go all the way back to Genesis if we're talking about God in the workplace. God gave Adam the garden. He was right there with him. He was in the workplace. So from the design in the beginning. And, I mean, it's just common sense for everybody that sits in here, but it's, it's not as common as what we would like it to be. That, hey, we can't just get to work and say, hey, that's not who I am anymore, and I'm going to leave Jesus outside, and at 5 o'clock I'll come back out and plug you back in, and away I'll go. That's not what it's about. We're not going to reach the people expecting everybody to come to the churches because they're not. We've got to go out to them. And if we're going to spend 40 hours a week somewhere building relationships, what better place to do it than in the workplace? Where else do I spend more time? There's no place that I spend more time than in the workplace getting to know people. And if I'm purposeful about it, I can take the casual relationships and then move them into meaningful relationships and then move them into spiritual relationships over time. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, too busy, not enough time, um, four businesses, wife, four kids, um, elder at a church. I understand busy, but we can find time to do those things. Hey, am I willing to give up one lunch a week to do something like this? Am I willing to get up earlier one day and go meet people for breakfast? What am I willing to do to make that time for God? Don't feel qualified. That's the pastor's job. Um, I mean, the pastors are anointed. All of you pastors are anointed in, a, in a, just an amazing way, but it's all of our job, and we are qualified. Sometimes we feel like Gideon, and we don't think that we can do things, but it's not our strength. It's God's strength. It's God's power. He says uh, in 1 Peter 3.15, In your hearts, honor the Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So always be prepared. It doesn't say pastors always be prepared. It says all of us always be prepared. We're all called to share when he sends us out. Um, afraid people may not look at me or like me, I'm sorry, or look at me differently. Yes and yes. That can happen. It does happen. It's happened to me over the 35 years more than once. I can remember when I was young, and we were just... I was, it was less than a year since I had made my decision and really surrendered my life, and we were on fire, and we were talking about it at work. And this guy at work pulled me into his office and just berated me. I mean, just berated me about, um, you know, even talking about God at work or how could I um, believe what I believed. And he was just so angry, and it caught me off guard. It was the first time that I had ever seen that, but we should expect that that's going to happen sometimes. It's a spiritual battle, and those types of things go on, and all we're called to do, and I was called to do, is just continue to love on him. He was actually uh, kind of a friend of my parents, and by the time he passed away, he had accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior, so he had had that change, and I'm not saying that anything that I did had an impact on that, but what I'm saying, we just don't know where people are, and we're called to love them, and irregardless of if, we attack, if, if we're attacked by them, um, we have to be wise with how we respond. And we are going to get attacked. It is going to happen. You can expect it. Concerned I may lose my job. Um, I haven't seen that happen yet. I'm not saying that it couldn't happen. Um, if it did happen, one thing I know, I, Hudson Taylor has a saying um, uh, that he said, God's work, and I've got it up in my office, God's work done God's way will never lack God's provision. So I have believed that wholeheartedly. And if I was doing God's work and somebody let me go, now if, if I'm not showing up for work on time and if I'm doing a terrible job, I can't blame that on, hey, it was because um, I was sharing my faith. But if... Uh, it did happen, and it was because I was sharing my faith, faith, and I was a great employee. There's no doubt in my mind that God's going to replace that with something better. I mean, he promises that. We can hold on to that promise. So coworkers are hostile towards anything spiritual. Again, that kind of goes back to what we talked about a minute ago. My company has a policy against it. 
I really haven't seen that yet. I'm not saying that something like that couldn't happen. But if you look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, um, at the end of that, it says, against these things, man can make no law. So if we're just doing those things and then sharing outside of work beyond that, so if we're doing the fruit of the Spirit out of Galatians is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So if we're doing those things inside of the workplace and we're pouring that into people, and then they can't tell me what I can do with my personal time, and then outside of that, I'm meeting with people and pouring into them and loving them and drawing them to Jesus. Um, but, but I honestly have not seen, I have seen in a couple cases uh, where their companies have had policies for supervisors where they couldn't do something like that with people that worked for them for whatever reason. Um, but that's the only thing that I've seen in the 35 years. And then I've invited them to church, and that's great. Yes, we need to do that. We should be inviting people to church. Some people won't come. So, I mean, we have to pour into them right where they're at. But also inviting them to church, it's like we're almost like saying, here, here, I'm going to hand you off to the pastor, and now it's their job, and it's not my job. We can't just invite them to church. We've got to meet them at church. We've got to take them to lunch after church. We've got to then talk to them at work. We've got to do what Mike did with me, and we've got to say, hey, am I willing to pour into them and to mentor them and to um, go through and build them up? We've got to pour into people beyond to just making um, that invite. But by all means, yes, we should be inviting people to church. John Newton, who wrote... Um, Amazing Grace, and I'm sure you all know who he was. He was a slave boat captain um, back in the 1700s, and he had a radical conversion and became a priest. Um, wrote to William Wilberforce, who was a young man at that time in Parliament, and a lot of you probably know about him as well, but he was in Parliament in England trying to get the slave trade stopped there. And he wrote this to him, and I, I read it a while ago, and I, I just think it just applies to us in the marketplace as well. He said, the example and even the presence of a consistent character may have a powerful, though unobserved, effect on others. You are not only a representative of Yorkshire, you have the far greater honor of being a representative for the Lord in a place where many know him not, and an opportunity of showing them what are the genuine fruits of the faith that you are known to profess. So how true is that for us, where the workplace is concerned as well, where he talks about um, where many know him not? I've, I've had opportunities um, to speak with especially people in their early 20s and share with them. And a lot of them, not a lot of them, some of them don't even know the basic Bible studies. I mean, you're starting from... I, you would think that everybody would know the story of Noah or those types of things. We're getting into a generation where that's just not true anymore. It's not true. And in some ways, it's almost better. I don't want to say it's better, but in some ways it offers a different type of opportunity where we're starting with someone who has all kind of questions and not, not a lot of preconceived notions about who God is and Jesus is. So, I mean, that can, but that's where we're at at this point, and especially in the marketplace as we go out there um, and, and work with people. So there's a couple scriptures that I want to read um, that, uh, you know, I think are foundational for um, talking with people about sharing in the marketplace. Uh, Romans 10, 14. How can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And then the Great Commission, obviously, Matthew 28, 18, and 20. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of age. And then 2 Corinthians is the last one um, that I'll, out of chapter 5. 
In Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. I'll read that again. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. I can't tell you how many times as I've been talking with people, they've, 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 they've said, you know, that's Jesus' job, or that's God's job. Or, and Jesus did the job 2,000 years ago. We can't do that. I can't save anybody. We, none of us can save anybody. That's what Jesus did. But as we read through scriptures, it's not that we don't play a part from that moving forward and drawing people to him, that we're not his ambassadors. I don't know how we can read through the scriptures at different places and think that we don't play a part. And that's not part of all of our jobs, and it is. And so the marketplace, as we go out there and as we're working in the marketplace, is a target-rich environment for sharing God with people. They may not always be receptive, but if they feel our love and they see, see our love, and if it's not just about a bunch of rules, and if we're building relationships and pouring into people, that gives us the foundation to make a, to make a difference. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes here, another 15 minutes or so, and then take some questions. But I'm going to go through a few things that over the past 35 years I've seen as foundational as far as having uh, impactful ministry in the marketplace. Um, first is, and it runs right along with the theme of the, um, what, what we've been talking about here and what, what everybody's been uh, preaching about here, and that is prayer. Um, a successful outreach starts with prayer and it's foundational. So at our businesses, um, we're fortunate enough to, we have prayer um, each day, and the prayer meeting that goes on each day, I'm not a part of that one, but a group gets together um, at a first break time, and they read the proverb of the day uh, together, so whatever day of the month it is, they read that proverb, and then they pray. So every day we have that. And then once a week, I get together with a group, and we do a Bible study and prayer um, at lunchtime, and it's for... Um, some of my spiritual leaders that are there, as well as family members. So for a long time, we had four generations of my family at our businesses praying. My grandma would come in, my mom was there, she would come in, myself, and then uh, one of my children would be there as well. So there would be four generations on top of other stuff, praying for the people that work there, praying for things that people brought up to us from a health standpoint, praying for their families, praying for the community, and that's foundational in what has gone on from a spiritual standpoint, and I believe as well how we have been blessed in the physical realm as well, um, and, and has got, has, how God has poured out his blessings on us. But also we talked about the miracles. Jesus went and did the miracle um, in the workplace with James and Peter, and um, I'm going to uh, pick on my daughter because she's a family member. We've seen other stuff go on, but I'll just tell that story real quick. So my daughter, when she was in high school, was having headaches, just terrible headaches. And we, so we took her into the doctor, and they did a CAT scan. And um, he called me at work, and he said, you need to get a hold of Karen, and you need to go pick Adrian up. Um, we read something on the CAT scan, and you need to get her to the hospital. Uh, or actually it was an MRI. So he said, you need to go get a CAT scan. So not the, not the phone call you want. So I grabbed her. We went in. When we got there, uh, they did everything, and they called us into a room, and they showed us, and they said, you see that spot that's on her brain? They said, that's not normal, and that's what's causing some of the issue, but we don't know what it is. So they did a bunch of tests, and we prayed, and um, they couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, they, we ended up going to Cleveland Clinic with some specialists, and they immediately knew what it was. And they said it's a cavernous angioma, which is a bunch of small blood vessels that didn't form right when she was born. And they started to bleed, and it was bleeding on her brain, and that was what was causing the problem. So we prayed. We prayed here at church. We prayed at work. We prayed everywhere, at home. Uh, we laid hands on her. For six years, she had nonstop headaches. So they never went away. 
So I, I had a friend who I had met through business, and we became uh, spiritual friends. His name was Mark Gurley. And uh, Mark's great-great-grandfather, I think it was, Phineas Gurley, was Abraham Lincoln's pastor. He had a lineage of healing, and they started the healing rooms in Grand Rapids. Well, um, we became friends, and he said, hey, I, I would like to do a teaching on the Holy Spirit in the workplace. Can I use your company as a guinea pig? Can I come down and teach some of your leaders who want to come on hearing from the Holy Spirit in the workplace? And I said, sure, no problem. So there was about 15 of us in the room, and Mark came down and was teaching on that. And at one point, he was going through, and he didn't know Adrian's situation. He said it would be like if somebody had headaches all the time. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, stop and tell him about Adrian. So I said, Mark, hold on a second. I said, actually, Adrian does have headaches nonstop, and she has. And he said, well, can we pray for her? He said, sure. So we all stretched out our arms, and he put his hand on her head and started to pray. And she felt her head beating, and he felt heat in his hand, and her headaches went away instantly. And she, she has, yeah, praise God, and she has not had headaches since then. Six years, no headaches. That was in the marketplace. That was a miracle in the marketplace. And it wasn't that we hadn't prayed in other places. And I can't tell you why God didn't heal her six years before. I'm thankful that he did when he did, and he uses it the way that he used it. Um, and it means what it means. But we've seen other things go on like that. So as you pray in the workplace, and as we expectantly look to God to do immeasurably more than we can think or imagine, um, through his power, that verse says, not through our, ours. Well, I, I can't do any of that, but he can. But we just have to believe it. We have to know who he is, and we have to know that he wants to work there just as much as he wants to work um, anywhere else. There, he wants to go everywhere and be everywhere, including the workplace. Loving our neighbors. So if, if prayer is foundational, uh, which it is, and it starts there, and I think, you know, one of the things that I was taught by the man that uh, mentored me was through prayer. When I first started off praying, it was like a shotgun list of things that I thought, you know, I should be praying and that I wanted or needed or whatever it was. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, that's okay. You need to talk to God, but you also need to listen. And he said, you know, you look at what Jesus did. He got away. And then when he talked to people, he said, I can only do what the Father tells me to do. So he was listening. So he taught us how to listen to and listen for the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we pray, we listen, and then we obey. And then part of that obeying is loving our neighbors. So um, if we're going to build those relationships that we talked about and take them from just the casual ones into meaningful ones and spiritual ones, one of the best ways to do that um, besides praying for the people, on top of that is actually loving our neighbors and loving them. So when, the, when the, the expert in the law came up to Jesus and said, you know, hey, what are the most two important commandments? He takes them back to Deuteronomy and to Levit Leviticus, and it starts with, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. So, hey, God's at the center. That's what we've been talking about. That's where it has to be. And then the next one is love your neighbor as yourself. And that's that outreach part that we're talking about right now. How do we reach out into our sphere of influence and have the largest impact we can possibly have for him? And then not grow weary. Um, I had a friend for 20, I think it was close to 25 years. We had worked together. Um, and about a year ago, uh, he, was, he had not given his life to the Lord. He came into my office, he closed the door, and with tears in his eyes, he said, um, he said, I, 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 gave, I think it was like two or three weeks before, he said, I gave my life to Jesus. He said, thank you for not giving up on me, and thank you for pouring into me um, over the past 20 whatever years it had been. So it would be easy to think, hey, um, this person's just not going to make that decision. But we don't know that. We don't know that. God does. So we continue to love them. We continue to love on people. We can do it uh, in a myriad of ways inside of the workplace. Um, but one of the best ways is just being kind. Being kind. Romans 2.4 says God's kindness leads people to redemption. 
So it doesn't say I'm going to argue them in. It doesn't say I'm going to use the Bible to shame them in. It says God's kindness leads people to redemption. So you can never um, underestimate just what being kind to somebody, the type of impact that that has and the draw that is, because it looks different. Society's not that kind right now. If you just get on Facebook, which I'm not on, but my kids, I think some of them still are. Maybe they're all off not too, but they used to share stuff. And there were times people would say stuff about me on there, and they're like, Dad, they're saying this about you, you know, because of your stand or whatever it is. And I'm like, you know, that's okay. I'm not there, you know. But people, um, unfortunately, especially on social media, just feel comfortable in being nasty at times. So kindness then becomes something that differentiates us as followers of Jesus from everybody else in society. If we can work at that and make sure that we don't fall into that same trap that everybody else is, we look different and we become attractive to them. And then being spiritually attractive, um, you know, part of that is um, being a good worker. So we kind of alluded to it a little while. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But if you're going to work and you're not showing up on time, you're grumbling, you're acting like everybody else is acting, you're not getting a lot done, then we're, we're going to lose some of that witness that we can have as opposed to if we're excelling at what we do, irregardless of the situation, it's going to be much, much more meaningful. A couple of verses on that. Um, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for man. And then one that caught me when I was reading through Proverbs when I was younger, and it's kind of always stuck with me, and the first time I read it, I was like, I can't even believe this is in the Bible, but... It's Proverbs 18, 9. It says, whoever is slack in his work is brother to him who destroys. So, you know, I don't think being, that's not good. I don't think we want, I don't think we want to be slack in our work. I think we want to um, pursue excellence because we serve an excellent God. We serve an amazing God. We serve the creator of the universe. And he's creative. He can give us creative amazing ideas inside of our workplaces. I can't tell you the number of times, um, and we talk about time, and, and one of the things that people said is we don't have enough time, but how God makes time for me. I, I use an example from just, uh, it's fairly recent, past few years, where uh, I was walking through the shop and they were having all kinds of problems with one of our machines and I looked at it and instantaneously, they had been working on it for a couple of hours, I knew what the issue was. And it was an obscure issue that I should not have known. And I said, I think you need to look at this. And they said, really, I don't think that's it. And I said, no, humor me, just look at it. And I walked away and I came back and that fixed the issue. And the issue was fixed. And that wasn't me, that was the Holy Spirit. So what that did was that saved me a half a day or a day's worth of time that I would have been there hunting through trying to figure out what that is. So, you know, we can, if we, um, if we yoke up with God and if we, if we look back to that Hudson Taylor saying, God's work done, done God's way will never lack his provision, that provision is not just fiscal. That provision is time. That provision is the resources that we need. That provision is the ability to do uh, the things that we want to and that he needs us to do inside of the workplace from a spiritual standpoint. So we just need to continue to trust him and pour into him and continue to cry out to him for his direction. Um, you know, as we, um, as I tell people and work with people about taking God into the workplace, one of the things that I tell them to do once you start praying and find other people to pray, Jesus sent out um, I think it was in Luke, he sent out the 72 in pairs of two. So if you can find other people to pray with, we have that inside of our work. It doesn't have to be somebody that goes to the same church that you go to, just somebody that believes uh, the same things that you believe from the standpoint of who Jesus is and what the Bible teaches and that it's God's written word. But if we can find those people that are like-minded to pray with, um, that's huge. And then take that... Um, that time and listen 
and then get those marching orders and then go out and have an impact inside of the marketplace. Uh, you know, we have an opportunity to help people around us inside of the workplace discern light from darkness, truth from lies, true joy from fleeting happiness, eternal hope from despair, and reality of eternity from the here and now. Jesus, when he was walking through, and I'll finish up with this, he's walking through in Matthew 9, and um, he's going through the towns and the synagogues and the countryside and he's seeing the crowds and he tells his disciples he says you know it's the bible says he has compassion on them and then he says um, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few ask the lord of the harvest therefore to send workers out into the harvest field and the marketplace is one of those places that's a harvest field that as we continue to pray, if we're getting together and we're praying, that's one of the things we pray is that God will continue to raise people up and send them out into the marketplace so that we can have an impact for them for eternity. Um, as at times I've gotten busy and, and started to maybe think about coasting or wanting to coast a little bit, he always brings to mind the stanza from Amazing Grace that says, when I've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, I'll have no less days to sing his praise than when I first begun. And the picture that I get is who out of all of these people inside of my sphere of influence is going to be there singing with me and who's not. And then that just brings me back, right back to the reality of a lot of this stuff, stuff is a temporal and what I need to be focused on is what's eternal. All right, so I'll, I'll attempt to answer a few questions if you guys have any questions. Um, you're all wore out? <laughs> it's, it, yeah. Both, yeah. <laughs> Um, at that time, it was a little uncomfortable, just being honest. I mean, they, we had relationships, and I had known them long enough that they had earned the right. It wasn't like a stranger coming up to me. And so I knew who he was, and I had seen the changes in their lives. So from that standpoint, um, I was okay with it. If it had been just somebody on the street corner or a stranger doing that, then it would not have had the same meaning. So it comes around those relationships. Life revolves around relationships, our relationship with God and others. And then um, it, because they had that relationship with me and because they were willing to do that, um, it did. It got me to the point of where I just said yes to get them you know, off my back and to go. And, and then God used that in, a, in just a mighty way to transform me in my life. That, that their willingness to do that and care about me and love me that much um, changed my life. I mean, continuing to show God's love as hard as it is in those types of situations. He tells us to uh, love our neighbor. And when you go to the, um, the parable that speaks about that, um, you know, the person, the good Samaritan, the Samaritans were not liked by the Jewish people. They were considered half-breeds. They had, they had um, been conquered by Syria a long time before, intermarried, and it was, so when Jesus used that as an example to us, he's saying, hey, we're called to love everybody, and he tells us to love our enemies. So I would say, you know, I, I, I would try to limit my interactions with people that are overly hostile. There's no reason to. It's just, uh, it's, it can be I don't want to say it can be a waste of time, but you continue to love them, but I'm not going to spend all of my time with them because all it is, I did that when I was uh, 
first a Christian at first, somebody wanted to be confrontational, all of a sudden they were taking all my time. And I was spending all of my time with them instead of, where I, instead of where I should be spending it. So the enemy was using them to distract me and take me somewhere else. So I would say continue to um, love on those people, continue to act in the way that Jesus would act, continue to try to pour out the fruit of the Spirit, but also be wise enough to limit the interactions and spend your time where you should be spending it. Yeah. Either one of you guys. Yeah, remote work is surely a new dynamic, and over the past two years when I've spoke, that seems to be one of the ones that comes up almost every time, because it, it is different, and especially, I mean, it's, I don't know that it's that different for people who are in their 20s, but for me, pushing almost 60 now, it's different for me. I'm just not used to that, and that's, that's not the way I work. But a lot of the same principles apply. And what I've seen people do is as they're pouring into people and as they see opportunities inside of um, meetings on, um, you know, social, on, on the Internet, however they're doing it, um, what they've done is then th the same way you might pull somebody aside if you're at work and speak to them in a one-to-one, -one, they reach out to them after they've had, not in front of everybody, and then they have a one-to-one -one in that manner and pour into them in that way. But the hostile person, which we all will deal with if we're um, out in the workplace and you're trying to share your faith, there's nobody that won't. It's the same type of thing that I just talked about, and that is, um, you know, praying, being wise um, with how much time I spend with that person, how I interact with them, definitely loving them and showing the fruit of the Spirit so they can see what's different. I mean, you think about that individual that screamed at me when I, and I, he literally was yelling at me, calling me names, closed the door, was just hostile. He gave his life to Jesus before he died as he went later on in life. And who knows how many people and how they reacted to them, him when he was hostile, what kind of impact that had on him and how the Holy Spirit was able to use that. Amen. That is so true, and it's and it and it's becoming more and more and more prevalent in that manner. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you definitely want to armor up, and that's why I call it marketplace missionaries, because if you think about missionaries, they're going over, in many cases, into hostile in environments, hostile places, and they're bringing the gospel, and um, I use that, and God gave me that word for that very reason. It can be that way and is that way. So about three years ago, God started to lay on my heart to write a book. Um, I didn't want to. It's not something that I had ever desired to do and told him no basically for six months, kind of ignored him until he beat me over the head. And um, I finally went to Karen and said, uh, I think God is saying that I should write a book. What do you think? And she's a protector of my time. And she does just a wonderful job with that. She's just a wonderful partner in all of this. And so I was hoping she would tell me no. And <laughs> And she said, no, I think you're supposed to. And I'm like, oh, shoot. So, so I ended up uh, being obedient and doing what I was called to do. But I say all that to say that um, just, uh, you know, I've spoken a little bit about what's in here. There's more than that. We brought books as gifts to all of you. So if you want a book, go up and take a book. If you have somebody you want to give one to, go ahead and take two. But that's our gift to all of you. Um, so not all the workshops have gifts, but we have a gift for you. <laughs> 
All right. All right. Thank you so much. God bless all of you.